Now, you have a source for the truth in the news. W. Dean Shook, End Time News. Your connection to the signs of the times. And welcome to End Time News. I'm your host, W. Dean Shook. Thank you for being here. As usual, I appreciate every single one of you. I want to start with a story from the Daily Beast, which I thought was rather interesting, seeing how we just released five terrorist meters from Guantanamo Bay. Let's see what happens when these guys are released. ISIS leader says, I'll see you in New York. When Abu Barak Baghdadi walked away from a U.S. detention camp in 2009, the future leader of ISIS issued some chilling final words to the reservists from Long Island. The Islamic extremist, some are now calling the most dangerous man in the world, had a few parting words to his captors as he was released from the biggest U.S. detention camp in Iraq in 2009. He said, I'll see you guys in New York, recalls Army Colonel Kenneth King, then the commanding officer of Camp Buka. King didn't take these words from Baghdadi as a threat. Al-Baghdadi knew that many of his captors were from New York, reservists with the 306th Military Police Battalion, which is a unit based in Long Island that includes numerous, numerous members of the police department and fire department. The camp itself was named after FDNY Fire Marshal Ronald Buka, who was killed at the World Trade Center on September 11th of 2001. King figured that al-Baghdadi was just saying that he had known all along it was essentially all a joke, that he had only to wait and he would be freed to go back to what he had been doing. Like, this is no big thing. I'll see you on the block, King says. King had not imagined that less than five years later he'd be seeing news reports that al-Baghdadi was the leader of the ISIS, the ultra-extremist army that was sweeping through Iraq toward Baghdad. I'm not surprised that it was someone who spent time in Bukha, but I am a little surprised it was him, King says. He was a bad dude, but he wasn't the worst of the worst. Oh my goodness, and our president just released five of the worst of the worst. Moving on from Breitbart News, there are some unaccompanied foreign children receiving better care than U.S. foster kids. On June 13th, DHS Secretary Jay Johnson told reporters in a press conference the federal government would do what was in the best interest of thousands of unaccompanied alien children, or UACs, crossing the border into southern Texas every week. He also denied that taxpayer-funded care being provided to them was serving as an incentive to Central American families to send more of their children but a closer look at the services UACs are receiving while they go through the removal proceedings tells a bit of a different story. Over the last several weeks, U.S. Border Patrol stations in South Texas have been overrun with illegal immigrants from mostly Central America. Johnson said that since October of 2013, agents have apprehended over 47,000 UACs, unaccompanied children, roughly double the 24,000 of UACs who were apprehended the previous fiscal year. Prior to 2012, the average number of UACs under U.S. government supervision averaged about 7,500 kids. According to procedures outlined in the Homeland Security Act of 2002, he stated the goal was to transport these children in a safe and humane manner to the Department of Health and Human Services, well, they would be cared for by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, or the ORR. The primary goal of the ORR is to reunite UACs with family members or other legal guardians in the United States while they go through removal proceedings. However, if those family members or guardians are in the country illegally, there was no indication by DHS officials that those individuals would be placed into removal proceedings Procedures for transporting and caring for UACs depend on the children's ages. According to the ORR's Division of Unaccompanied Children's Services, most UACs over the age of 13 are placed in shelters or group homes. However, the UACs ages 13 and younger who don't have a relative or guardian who can take care of them 
Short and long-term foster care is available through ORR's Foster Care Program Network, which, of course, is taxpayer-funded. And I haven't forgot our listeners in the UK. Here is one for you. According to the former UK Defense Secretary, ISIS could bring terror to Britain unless it's confronted now. Al-Qaeda's offshoot ISS, that's the Islamic State of Iraq, will bring jihad to Britain if it's not confronted immediately in Iraq, claims a former British Defense Secretary, Liam Fox. Writing in the Sunday newspaper today, Mr. Fox has said that well-funded, highly disciplined, and arguably the most powerful non-state military force in the Middle East poses a threat to Britain in that it could easily export terrorism abroad from an Iraqi foothold. Mr. Fox went on to say we cannot afford to have Islamic extremists coming home with Britain passports, having waged successful jihad across the Middle East. That's why it's absolutely imperative that ISIS is defeated. So far, the Iraqi army has displayed little more than incompetence and cowardness. This morning, however, UKIP's increasingly influential leader, Nigel Farage, said the calls for intervention in Iraq could go unheeded. Farage, who was one of the first to dismiss any intervention in Syria, said the former Prime Minister Tony Blair should remain silent on the issue, and that Britain's days of intervening around the world should be over. But Fox's words are in stark opposition to Mr. Farage, proving that on international intervention, there's a very distinct difference of opinion even on the British conservative spectrum. Many will be tempted to say, it's not our problem. It's something happening far away. That would be the wrong conclusion to draw, claim Fox. If ISIS wins in Iraq, it could easily become an ungoverned space that encourages and trains terrorists even more than Afghanistan before 9-11. And we all know the costs we had to bear as a consequence. It's absolutely essential that we do not allow that to happen. Well, I agree with you folks in the UK. And amid all of the crisis we're facing at this very moment, what is our president doing? Well, on Father's Day, Obama's vacationing despite Iraq, Ukraine, and the immigration crisis. Even as Iraq is falling to renewed attacks by radical Islamists, pro-Russian forces are escalating the killing of Ukrainian soldiers as thousands of illegal immigrants are surging across our border, causing misery and national health crisis. President Obama has decided to take an extended weekend vacation, perhaps get in a little golf. The president and his family have jetted off to the desert oasis of Rancho Mirage, California, for an extended Father's Day vacation. As a Los Angeles local CBS affiliate noted, Obama's staff has helpfully scoped out some golf courses, gave a list to Obama just in case he wanted to spend Father's Day on the links. If the president breaks out the clubs once again, it'll be the sixth time that he's golfed at Rancho Mirage since entering the White House. As of May 24, 2014, President Obama has hit the links 173 times since becoming president. No taxpayer-funded trip for Obama would be complete without some fundraising. On Saturday, the president is scheduled to attend a fundraiser for the Democratic National Committee as a closed-door event in a private home in Orange County, California. While in California, Obama also delivered the UC Irvine commencement address at, at Angeles Stadium in Anaheim. And here's another one out of Breitbart News. Liberals furious over South Carolina law to teach the Constitution in schools. The Republican-controlled legislature in South Carolina recently infuriated liberal groups by insisting the state universities teach about the U.S. Constitution and other founding documents. The South Carolina House of Representatives had recently cut fundings for two state universities that had required students to read homosexual-themed books. This month, the revised budget restored the funding. But the renewed funding had strings attached. The new budget stimulated the money was to be used for instruction in the provision and principles of the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Federalist Papers, including the study and devotion of American institutions and ideals. 
The debate began in March when Representative Gary Smith introduced the legislation to deduct $52,000 from the budget of the College of Charleston and 17000 from the University of South Carolina over the two schools' reading requirements. The College of Charleston assigned a book called Fun Home by Allison Betchell, which is about a lesbian woman and her relationship with her father, who she one day learns is gay, too. The University Herald website reported in March, South Carolina Upstate assigned a freshman course to read out loud The Best of Rainbow Radio, which is a collection of stories from the state's first radio show targeted for a homosexual audience. Critics of the legislation said the Republicans were attacking academic freedom. As a compromise, state Republicans added a provision for schools that have a mandatory reading schedule to provide an, an alternative in case acquired books conflict with the students' religious tenets. And here's one from the Christian Post. Homosexual behavior policy leads lawyers to vote to deny university law school accreditation. Attorneys have voted to deny a Canadian Christian University law program accreditation due to the school's policy on homosexual behavior. British Columbia's attorneys have denied Trinity Western University from issuing law degrees over the school's stance on homosexuality. Lawyers from the Law Society of British Columbia voted to prevent the BC Trinity Western University from conferring law degrees due to the school's community convention agreement, which requires the students voluntarily abstain from sexual intimacy that violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, according to the National Post, despite early results, which suggest an overwhelming victory of 32,010 to 968, the decision is not binding and only expresses the sentiment of those at the Law Society. 31 benchers are still responsible for offering the final verdict on the law school, which is opening in 2016. TW President Bob Kuhn argued in a statement that difficult decisions involving fundamental rights and freedoms should not depend on a popular opinion. In April, the LSBC benchers made their decision in a 20-7 vote after the thoughtful and measured expressions and views, considerations and reports and submissions and the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2001. The thorough process taken by the LSBC should not be undermined by a vocal group that organizes a special meeting, Coombs summarized. And there's a new feature on our website. It's live breaking news 24-7, 365, right at the bottom of the homepage. Just go to wdeanstook.com. Scroll down to the bottom, past the stories that you're going to check out that we post from our newscast, and you'll see live breaking news 24 hours a day. We are living in unprecedented times, constant wars worldwide, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. They're genetically modifying our food, increased violence as the heart of man grows cold, ever increasingly tyrannical governments around the world. Stay connected. End Time Prophecy News with W. Dean Shook. Your connection well, to the Well, we are living in strange time. times. Make sure you stay tuned to End Time News. I'm your host, W. Dean Shook. I'll try to keep you informed on as much news when it pops up. I'll see you on our next program. Thank you. You can get these full stories and more at WDeanShook.com. That's WDeanShook.com.